but we can but why haven't you gone to, to, to want to hospital because it is known that if for instance a mother dies because of when she's producing or something, mm -hmm. the other one they they will be arrested. If that will be responsible, even the husband will say to himself that he have to explain and if they know the responsible person. Mm -hmm. So even if you know, they, they see I'm having a headache and they have locked yourself in the area of the city, but have you gone to the That's not a good thing. So basically, if, if you ask uh, a fetus which country they want to be born in, you <laughs> <laughs> choose Uganda. Yeah. And we talk about how to solve that problem. We dig a little deeper into the statistics and analyze that for you in terms of our health budget. A big chunk of it actually has been left to donors. We talk about that and why. We talk about some of the causes of these very early deaths, uh, a day old, um, a month old, 282 kids that are going to die by the end of today and how preventable that can be and of course the solutions to that as well and we give you a chance to be a part of our discussion when we come back so don't go anywhere Welcome back and thank you for watching NTV. My name is Beth. We're talking about uh, save, the save the Children Report, the death of the world's mothers. What is the Really, really in Uganda, really. Second worst place to be born in East Africa. And of course, in Uganda, we have a tendency to be very negative. So, what is talking about um, in terms of why the problem has come from with all these young children, the infants dying, the children's sister? Are we regressing? Are we progressing? Have we made any progress? Have the problem been this bad for a very long time? Have we made any improvements in the last five, ten years? Um, okay. Is there hope for us, really? Okay. Unfortunately, despite the fact that uh, under five and child mortality has improved, the newborn mortality has remained stagnant. Mm -hmm. But we also know that as you continue reducing the child mortality and newborn and infant mortality, the newborn mortality becomes visible. Right now, out of 10 children who die in their first year, you find that four of them will have died in the first month. It has been like that for the last 15 or 20 years, making it even more urgent for us to do something about it if we are to dent the infant and child mortality. The maternal mortality also has not changed much, although we have started registering some improvement now. It has remained, if you compare the last few DHS and the most recent DHS, statistically there wasn't much change. But in between now, the new figures coming in seem to show that actually we have improved some services, access has improved, but the problem remains actually a big one. And that means that, that because we know that um, when you lose a mother, you also have a higher chance of losing a baby. Studies mm -hmm. have shown that uh, a child who has lost a mother has six times chances of dying, and the other siblings also have a higher risk of dying. And again, we also know that when mothers know that their babies are going to die, they tend to have many more children. And in the process, they tend to die. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a vicious cycle which we need actually to look at in a more holistic way. We need to look at the whole continuum of care and look at all the deaths along the continuum of care. But so that we when you think look at the numbers, though, like we've been talking about and the report very clearly is, you know, spells this out, mm. the majority of the infant mortality is actually from, you know, I mean, you, you might have 130,000 children dying every year, mm. but a big chunk of that is actually you know, if it's dying within the first month and the first year. Yeah. So the, the, the issue should be them fixing that first year, make sure the kids can get to their yes. first birthday, Dr. Moses. Yeah, well, um, but I think if you go back to the, the, the State of the World Mother's Report, we are now looking at the first 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And we found there are many strategic things you can do that can save those babies in the first 24 hours. For instance, we know that a premature, if you give corticosteroids to a mother, you're going to save that baby. Then we know also that if a child is born in a safe environment, you're going to avoid those infections. So there are many things. Even a kid, a baby who is born who is not breathing well, 
if it's delivered by skilled attendant, they would mm -hmm. identify the risk and resuscitate that baby. Mm -hmm. Those are the three, I think, most important thing that can make a difference. If you can do the basics, do the first 24 hours and also mothers to be followed up. Mm -hmm. To know that when they go, there are risk factors, they need to come back. Those are simple things. We can. We don't talk about rocket science. Simple. Keeping a baby warm. When a mother delivers in a hospital, a baby should be kept warm. But we're not doing the basics. And to me, that's why I like this state of the mother's report. Because it tells you these are simple things that can be done. They are not highly expensive. Mm -hmm. They are cost effective. They are cheap. Is this, is this a problem with there not being enough information to the mothers, uh, they, they don't know what to do, they haven't yeah. gotten enough uh, prenatal. There the are number of issues. People normally tend to think that probably it's only the health service side, but it's both sides. If you get to the community, it's an awareness issue. Most people think that they will not get much from the health facility, so they tend to go to the traditional birth attendants. And as you heard from the records, one out of two mothers are not delivering with us, mm -hmm. and they're delivering with traditional birth attendants who are probably not skilled and supervised and not even equipped. And they also delay them. Even when they come to us, they come too late. And you find that most mothers who die in our hands actually die in the first 48 or eight hours. Basically, they come too late when there's no blood, when you cannot fix them at all. So that's a big problem. On the supply side, also, we have some challenges. But I also wanted to touch on one thing about the funding. Honorable Yamochi touched on it. Because right now, if you look at our budget, 40% of the budget is coming from out of pocket. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to maternal and newborn services, 65% of the total health budget is coming from out of pocket. And that is that means the, mother, the people in the community are shouldering the whole budget for the health sector. And because and of that, that is not it's not cheap. It's not cheap. And because of that, people tend to avoid services because they can't afford. The price may be high. Also, maybe they may have other opportunity costs, you know. They have to look at where else to put the money. So the fact that most of the budget is being funded by the population is a big, big challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a clear financial barrier for accessing health services. So they tend to look for other alternatives. They go for the quick ones, and by the time they come to the services, it's too late. Even when they come, because they're not coming for the, the preventive services, there are also missed opportunities. If they're not coming for antenatal care, they're coming only once. They're coming when it's they were about to deliver, you find that by the time they come, so many complications have happened. Mm -hmm. So this issue of financing is a real one, and especially the fact that these finances are coming from the community. Also, because the, most of the financing is from the private sector, even when we have commodities which are free from the public sector, if we're not involved in the private sector where the mothers are going, this is a big missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. And when it gets now to the districts, if you look at the districts, and again in this budget, you find that um, the government, the public sector, is now only handling about 25% of the budget. And yet most of the actions happen at the district level. The districts handle about only 7%, so they are not even able to prioritize. Mm -hmm. They can't put this money into health work, the health workforce. It's too limited. So again, there's a big challenge. It's a trickle-down, it's a cascade effect, both on the supply side and also on the community side. You, you talked about priority. Um, I was on to Dr. Limoke here because they're the people responsible for prioritizing the money that, that we spend on, on these things. Uh, look at the budget. Works and transport is going to get about 15% of our budget. So is energy at about 15%. Energy uh, education at about 13%. And then the health sector gets pretty much less than half of that. Um, are, are you saying that health is half as important as education in terms of is it, is it a case in, in your opinion of misplaced priorities for us as a country definitely I, I, we have had that type of debate for a long time uh, both of course public uh, but also uh, behind the curtain and and our limit has been that um, yes we know that you need for instance support infrastructure we know that you need to support energy which is very useful but uh, we, our argument has been that uh, if, you, if the health of the people is not taken care of, then that support with infrastructure and energy is not very useful for the people. Because for this, the 16 mothers we're talking about, the 6,000 mothers in a year. Mm -hmm. Now we look at the next financial year, which is starting. Do you think, even if you constructed a road for that mother in her conference or whatever, is that very useful for her? Because mm -hmm. she's going to be dying. I, you know, you know. If I went to 
came from the point of view of the Bible. You know, one time I said, well, what is more important than someone to lose? And that's why the Jesus is important, to lose his own life for others. Mm -hmm. So that for me, I think that life is more important. For me, if I was coming out of here and someone says, I give you a kind, I give you a kind, or I kill you, I'd rather fool. It will take several days to reach my, my mm -hmm. village. In Palestine, to be killed. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I don't have a car, if I don't have food, and then gamble, you know, I'd rather have you live. So, I would think that even as government, as as we know, it even as we want to develop, we are, we are looking at infrastructure, and energy. I think we'd look at life as very important. And this, this, as the doctor has explained, we don't need much money. Actually, for us, from our point of view, is that even if we don't give out the 15 percent we are talking about, for this, for the explanation, our argument from the health committee was adding, we need about 20, about 20 billion, but we said we went at lowest and we said even if you added about 100 billion, mm -hmm. and we are talking about about 43 billion to go to recruit more health workers, and we're emphasizing uh, midwives. Because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, because mm -hmm. yes, you got, for instance, in a, a very successful story which took place in Sri Lanka. For them, what they did, and this has taken almost 40 years, and even stable, it is, it is even stable. They, 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 they achieved uh, all these the good indicators by just having what we call the public health midwives who went to the ground to even this was not, was not to stay in the health units but to go every day to meet the mothers mm -hmm. and they would advise them they would advise mothers on nutrition advise mothers on many of these missed opportunities that the doctor has been talking about and then finally they would advise mothers even when to go to the, the health they really keep registers they know that in this village they have five mothers mm -hmm. who are supposed to go for the next one on day X. Mm -hmm. So and then they will go there and say, but why, why have this one not turned up? Why have the two not? And then they will follow them up and go, now we'll be lucky that we can have now mobile telephone ne network. Mm -hmm. I mean, we never hold a bit of telephone. So you get it. Yeah, so if you have a list, because you have a midwife who would know, and then who would move around, and then who would be even if that why have you come and even address the mother to, today you should come for the network, and even for, 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 for children. Now, these activities needed just more funding, not, not much, just to, to sort of enhance because you need more, you need more midwives. Then also you might need some bit of like a base call because some of the midwives will be handling the whole parish, so they cannot just foot the whole day. They might need some money, base call to ride, mm -hmm. and they don't do all these things. Now, this are not, this is not much money. In fact, mm -hmm. when you look at this money, let me make this point very clear. When you look at the money that is going to infrastructure, do you know that for the last five years, we have been funding like, roads. Uh, 1.4 trillion, 1.5, 1.7, 1.0, like that range. But most of the time, the, not all the money is used. They, they come back with the money, return it, and they say because of the very contracting, you know, this type of capacity, all this type of thing. So, so why don't you, instead of giving 1.7, we say, why can't you, okay? After we by the end of the financial, not all that 1.7 will be used. Why can't you pick part of it and give to help? Or, even if they don't use it, most of it was not actually, is because of inflated the contracts. Mm -hmm. So why do you co inflate contracts when you know that you have people who are very serious? Because the children are talking about here, they tend, they, they have yeah, going to speak for the They are voices, they are being the voices. I don't know that I want to touch on. Uh, big elephants in, in every room pretty much when you come to discussions like this. A uh, small problem we have in this country called corruption. One has to ask a question, Dr. Mwange. If we manage to get rid of the corruption we have in this country, wouldn't there be enough money to solve these problems? The extra 100 billion shillings that Dr. Limoki is talking about. Uh, how much money do we lose in, in corruption, even in, in just the health sector alone? Wouldn't that solve our, our problem? Well, I wouldn't say that <coughs> if you eliminate corruption, you're going to solve every problem. Because there are also efficiency issues, mm -hmm. effectiveness issues, strategy issues. For instance, in the health sector, how we strategize to make sure that we are having a systems approach to managing all these problems. Dr. Romok is talking about infrastructure. In principle, if the, if the government invested in infra infrastructure, it would help us in terms of referral. Because you know our healthcare system is based on referral. Health center two refers to health center three, health center three refers to health center four. So if you have a good road network, 
a good ambulance system. Then you're going to have a system running very well. And when we talk about ambulance, we're not talking about uh, Land Rover or a van. It could no. easily be a bicycle that is modified in the area. The point that I'm making is so mm. if that's what infrastructure is good, yes. mm. but you see the type of infrastructure we have in Uganda is not useful for the far. Let me come back to Sri Lanka. What we did is in Sri Lanka, for them, they went and looked at infrastructure, which we are talking about the, the roads, those small uh, small roads. Small, 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 you know, trying to uh, take it, it is useful. I'm not really like, mm. for any infrastructure. But I would think. The question is that the, the balance. Yeah. What I'm hearing you say is balance. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Jessica, you're saying something. Yeah, I agree with him. Infrastructure is a big, still a big problem. And if you look also in the papers, you've been reading how ambulances were well failed to me. Sometimes they break down. But also, it has most been. Most of them actually uh, yeah. seem to have broken down. It has been shown that in most p parts of the country, the terrain can't even allow these ambulances. If you go to Mbulamburi, even Kasese here, even Fort Porto, we've been having a project there where we've been trying to try to subsidize uh, the mother's uh, budget to be able to come for the services. And we found that the only thing which made a big difference was having vouchers and using border borders. Mm -hmm. Border borders were the drivers of the impact we saw, despite the ambulances. Because if you have an ambulance, that sometimes you have to bring this mother and even take her back home. It will be difficult to have this ambulance everywhere. And especially the way it is designed now, the ambulance right now is based at the health facility. Mothers are in the community, so the mothers have to call this ambulance, it has to go there. So we need also to look at other alternative ways to support this infrastructure need, mm -hmm. like using the border border, something which is more closer to the people, but also available most of the time. It, it very ironic in, in Kampala and in urban centers, border borders are a menace and a source of death. Mm. And uh, hearing you saying that, you know, regarding infant mortality, they actually turn out to be yeah. <laughs> life savers. Mm -hmm. We're going to take another very short break. When we come back, uh, Dr. Moses is burning to say something. We'll yes, pick up with, with him. <laughs> and we also, I'm hearing a lot about systems, the systems we need to have in place. Yes. It's not just about money. What kind of systems? What's the state of our systems regarding uh, this problem? We'll talk about that and more. And of course, take your phone calls and give you a chance to be a part of, uh, of your discussion as you ask your questions and share your thoughts and ideas on how we can solve this problem of losing uh, b more than 130,000 infants every year to things that are really preventable. We'll be right back. Welcome back and thank you for watching NTV. My name is Ben Winne and we're having a very interesting discussion about solving the problem of infant mortality based on the Save the Children's 14th State of the World Mother's Report that has just come out. And it's not very good for Uganda. Our stats are appalling any way you think about it. And we are talking about how to solve that problem, what the problem is, and how we can go about it. Before we go into the break, we're talking about the state of the systems and the problems. I was asking the question that no one ever wants to ask about corruption. And it's some, you know, we have ways of going around that. Um, but in terms of systems, Dr. Moses, you are making some very interesting points about efficiency and the, the state of the systems that we have in our healthcare a system right now you want to pick up from, yes, I want from to there from there and say if you look at WHO, WHO recommends a health systems approach to implementing uh, health activities I'll just stuck one area like supplies supplies are very crucial for the survival of that baby and you focus at national medical stores our distribution system recently you saw on TV national medical stores is full of drugs the question is how are we moving the drugs to the health facilities? How are these kids, children, uh, accessing the, the, the medicines? So to me, when you look at the systems approach, is where the problem is. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Jessica Winnie and the Minister, uh. he was grappling with how are we going to ensure vaccines reach those babies? Uh. How are we going to ensure that mama kids reach the mothers? So to me, it's, it's, it goes beyond, and, and also, the little resources that we have the 7.2 percent Dr. Lemek has allocated the health sector, apart from the corruption, the little that is there, 
how are we going to use it and how are we going to prioritize it and and that brings me to the question of if you look at a mother in a holistic way mm -hmm. maybe she did not have a baby so she needs contraceptives maybe she doesn't have good nutrition she needs a bit of agriculture support to be able to do it so that to me it, it's a system we need to revamp the whole system how um dr jessica you deal a lot with these things at, at the ministry yeah how weak is our system right now or strong for that matter <laughs> well uh, it, it we have a lot of issues which are contributing to the system's weakness without answering it directly Vertical programs, for instance, uh, have been a big problem, you know. We've been having these strong vertical programs for HIV, for malaria. And sometimes, whereas these programs are bringing some benefits, they also sometimes weaken the systems. Decentralization.